Good day to member of Pediatric Society of Thailand, general physician who are interested in PM 2.5, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our PM 2.5 lecture series. Today's topic is Clean Air Act for the 21st century. We are very honored to have a world authority as a speaker on this subject. You may all know him well. He is Sir Stephen T. Hawkeye, who received his knighthood from the Queen of Great Britain and Commonwealth, led to his impressive contribution of his research in immunopharmacology and important role in British medical research cousin. Next, I would like to introduce our moderator, SOS Professor Vikparat Manu Yakon, a well-known Thai pediatrics allergist and research from the Department of Pediatrics, Lama Tibbani Hospital. Good, ap good afternoon, Sawadikha. Thank you very much, Professor Somsak Lopekha. We are really honored to have Professor Sir Stephen Hogate with us today. Actually, Professor Sir Stephen Hogate does not need any introduction. Currently, he is a Medical Research Council clinical professor of immunopharmacology at University of Southampton, UK Research and Innovation Clean Air Champion and Special Advisor to the Royal College Physician on Air Quality UK. He is one of the world authority in respiratory medicine, especially in asthma and allergy. He is also one of the world foremost spokespeople on the dangerous impact of air pollution. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Sir Stephen Hawke. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm deeply honoured to have this opportunity to speak uh, to your society today and uh, thank you for creating uh, the opportunity for me. I so appreciate it. What I'm going to do now is to share my screen with you all and put my slides up and hopefully they will appear. There we go. Good. I hope you can all see that. Um, so I just must first of all uh, thank you very much indeed for creating this time uh, in your busy schedules to hear what I have to say today. Uh, it is an area uh, that is of great personal interest to me, um, but I realise now that uh, having read a little bit more about uh, Thailand and air pollution, um, it's a major problem for you as well. So I'm delighted that we're going to share this agenda together. Uh, I put up my interests here, uh, which uh, I'm declaring, so you can have a quick look at that. But then I'll move on now to the main lecture. I was born in 1947, um, which obviously ages me a little bit, but uh, where I was born in Manchester in the northwest of England, I remember very clearly my father taking me down to the centre of the town and scenes like this one uh, being very obvious at the time. And of course, air pollution in those days, um, back in the 1950s in the UK and I guess in Thailand, but I don't know what it was like there then, air pollution was a huge problem and it was largely caused by the burning of coal by people heating their houses and of course using coal for industry. But then in 1952, in the winter of 1952, there was a particularly bad episode which in just a few days killed over 4,000 people and in fact, uh, looking over the next two weeks, more like 12,000 people died as a direct result of exposure to air pollution. And as you can see in the bottom right hand side here, when the air pollution particles, the black particles, black soot was mapped onto the death rate, we could see that they were superimposable, as was the sulfur dioxide level. So there was no doubt about the cause and effect of air pollution uh, and this terrible uh, death rate that occurred. And of course it led to the Clean Air Act in Britain in 1956, but we have a legacy from those air pollution periods of the 1950s and this is a, a study we published a year or two ago 
looking back at babies and children that were born between the Clean Air Act of 1956 um, and earlier and look at the uh, coal consumption across the whole of the United Kingdom in England and Wales uh, in relation to human disease now and even now ex <coughs> exposure to pollution during that period is bringing forward um, deaths uh, in, from a variety of diseases, cardiovascular, respiratory and metabolic. So really what we're talking about here is the effect of air pollution over the whole life course, not just episodes. And if we now start to look at what the current status is in the world, this is from the World Health Organization, you can see a pie chart and airborne particles in the top right hand corner is giving the adverse health impact equivalent to active and passive cigarette smoking. And so on the worldwide scale, this is a massive problem of public health that desperately needs attention. And of course, smoking is an issue we've been, we've known about for a long time, but the adverse health effects of air pollution probably hasn't had the vision that it probably deserves looking back over the last few years. So I did a little research to look at Thailand and some of the issues around air pollution there. And I was a bit surprised to see how bad the situation was. This is 2019. And as you can see, uh, you have two cities there. Uh, which are in the top 10 worst polluted cities in the world. And I can therefore fully understand why you are concerned about your, the effects of this on human health and on the future generation. And looking a little bit further and getting some measurements of air pollution, which are obviously doing very well, you can see in the bottom left hand side that Thailand probably has about twice the level of particulate air pollution uh, than um, one would like and, and exceeding the certainly the uh, European Commission and definitely the World Health Authority guidance. And you can see in the top of this slide the sort of relative financial costs. I mean this was 2013 but I'm sure the situation hasn't improved much since then but you can see it's costing your country an awful lot of money. Um, the adverse health effects created by this pollution. And as you can see in the bottom right hand side, some comparative statistics looking at South America uh, and looking at uh, Europe in terms and China in terms of the amount of money that uh, your country currently spends on cleaning up the environment. So this is a big issue for you and I can fully appreciate why you're so concerned. <laughs> One that we are concerned about as well. So a new Clean Air Act probably is the direction of travel here for Thailand and uh, let me give you some background that might help you in framing such an act. We now know that the World Health Organization has fully accepted air pollution as the greatest environmental cause of adverse human health and of course what we want to do is to clean up the air around the world so that we can improve things for the future generation. And you as paediatricians, I'm sure, are really concerned that the future generation is who we should be targeting uh, the changes towards. Of course, the, the origin of the pollution, different from what it was in the United Kingdom and I guess in Thailand back in the 1950s, where coal burning was a, a major issue, most of the air pollution now is coming from the use of vehicles and the emissions from burning diesel and petroleum and other uh, fossil fuels. And we have, of course, two aspects to this. We have the primary pollutants shown at the top of this slide being emitted from vehicles and from factories and sometimes uh, from uh, natural sources. But then we have chemistry going on in the atmosphere that generates these secondary pollutants where nitrates and sulfates and other uh, various pollutants react with each other to form a, these secondary particles, which I think is quite a big issue uh, in Thailand because it's catalyzed by temperature and sunlight. 
The particles we are, of course, concerned about are the very small ones that are breathed into the lung and go right the way down into the air sacs, the alveoli. The PM10, uh, 10 micrometers and less, and PM2.5, these are the two um, particle size ranges which are monitored in environmental monitoring. But as I shall speak about in a moment, uh, there are even smaller particles than the PM2.5, which seem to be the ones that are most problematic. We've known about the toxic effects of air pollution for many years. Uh, this is a study that Sandeep Salvi, one of my colleagues uh, from India, when he was in Southampton, did back in 1998 and 1999, showing that inhalation of diesel fumes in a localized space increased the infiltration of the lung by neutrophil leukocytes, by inflammatory cells. And of course, the reason for this is that the particles from the diesel contained reactive chemicals, both on their cell surface and within their substance that stimulated inflammatory pathways in the lung, both in normal people and to a greater extent in those with asthma and cardiovascular disease. And the reason for this, of course, is because these particles, when they're breathed into the lung, are treated by the lung and when they get into the circulation by the cardiovascular system as foreign particles. And they excite a rejection response through oxidative stress. And it's the chemistry around this oxidative stress that leads to the inflammation and the association with human disease, as I'll explain in a few moments. So the first question to ask is, does all of this occur in reality? In other words, it's all very well exposing people in chambers to pollutants, but can we actually show changes naturally? And this was a study conducted in Seattle a year or two ago. Uh, where they took 45 commuters traveling into the city and measured air pollution and the chemistry in their blood using a metabolomic uh, technique which looked at something like 220 to 500 different chemical substances simultaneously. And what they found in the study is that in that drive from home to work that they were able to detect in the blood 45 unique chemicals in the blood that were generated as a result of pollution exposure and that these chemicals differed whether you were a normal person or an asthmatic person and although this is a complicated slide what it's trying to demonstrate is that by breathing in these pollutant materials particularly particles and, and nitrogen dioxide we reduce the ability of the body to defend itself against oxidant stress and as a consequence, uh, by the time the person arrives at the workplace, the oxidant stress system is fully activated, as you can see there, and we get the inflammation and other effects. And if you're an asthmatic person, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, that some of the chemicals involved in asthma are also increased uh, in that drive uh, to work, showing that in the real world, exposure uh, to pollution on a highway from uh, home to Seattle city centre does in fact activate these pathways. And the chemistry is quite complicated and I need to go through it here, only to point out that particles in particular uh, contain soluble metals on the left, these chemicals called quinones which come out of uh, the combustion of uh, uh, fossil fuels and are highly reactive, as well of course as the particle surface themselves are able to interact with cells and in particular the mitochondria within cells to generate this reactive oxygen which is so damaging in the stress reaction. Sorry though. Not only does this occur in the lung, which we're very familiar with as respiratory physicians, but of course, as these small particles get into the circulation, they have widespread effects in a whole variety of different organs. And I've listed those uh, on this slide. The ones in heavy print uh, are the conditions currently included in the global, global burden of disease categories. And this really, therefore, is telling us 
as the metabolomic study in Seattle told us, that this is a systemic response to the exposure of air pollution and is not just a lung effect. And if we look at exposure of people across the world to different levels of pollution, on the left hand side are the European Commission limit target values. And you can see that a small percentage of people around the world are living in polluted uh, areas where there are, are illegal limits. But if we look at the right, the World Health Organization guidelines for the different pollutants, uh, which are purely health-based, show that large numbers of people are living in polluted air that's damaging their health. And since this was first perceived, you'll see that the uh, UNICEF organization has really picked this up because it's the children in particular that are being exposed to these uh, abnormally high levels of pollutant that are causing adverse health. Well, we now begin to understand that actually there may be no limits in terms of what one can be exposed to in terms of air pollution. This is a big study of 60 million people in the United States. And what it demonstrates is that the levels of particulates and a second pollutant ozone in relation to cardiovascular and other causes of death has a line that passes through zero. Uh, it's uh, a log ratio on the left, hence one. In other words, no level of air pollution is safe, right the way down to zero. So even though we're talking about uh, WHO limit values, uh, even below that, there are adverse health effects. This is a, another study uh, conducted uh, largely from China, as you can see in that map above, but also involving various cities in North America and in Europe, showing again, looking at uh, hundreds of millions of people, that the concentration of air pollution, PM10 on the right, PM2.5 on the left, versus death, you can see that there is again a line heading towards zero. But what's important on this graph is that at the lower levels, less than 25 micrograms per meter cube for PM2.5 and 50 micrograms per meter cube for PM10, that the dose response relationship changes and becomes steeper. This means that even at low levels of air pollution, we're getting quite significant effects. So any improvement in this below 50 and below 25 for PM10 and PM2.5 is going to be important. And finally, what we're measuring at the moment may not be the most important aspect of air pollution. The ultrafine particles, which are the nanoparticles shown in the bottom left hand side of the picture on the right, are even smaller. They're less than 100 nanometers across. And these, of course, have a much, much larger surface area and therefore a greater capacity to carry harmful chemicals, not only into the lung and the alveoli, but to be absorbed into the circulation. And it's these nanoparticles that I think are causing much of the problem we're observing. And of course, I keep talking about statistics and uh, increase in the number of deaths on a worldwide basis or a countrywide basis. But at the end of all of this, there are always individual human beings. And this is just one nine year old girl that I became very heavily involved with who had 27 hospital admissions in the space of three years before she died from her asthma. And she was living very close to a very busy highway in London where air pollution levels were at illegally high levels. And I think her death may well be attributed to that exposure. So we must never forget in all of this statistic <coughs> that there are real human beings at the end of it that are being affected by these pollutant areas. And certainly death being an endpoint of air pollution is a rather blunt one. But nevertheless, it's a pretty firm one. And as we can see in this study in China from Hubei province, where the um, uh, virus broke out fairly recently, you can see that levels of air pollution here, both particles, NO2 and ozone, positively correlated with increased asthma mortality for all three pollutants. And as a result of that, I think we can confidently say that even for death, uh, air pollution not involving just one pollutant, but all three 
vehicle related pollutants is causing a real problem, at least in terms uh, of asthma. So let's just stay with asthma for a moment since I'm talking to a pediatric society and of course asthma is a big uh, problem in pediatrics and this is looking now at an intervention in California. You'll be familiar I think with the California children's study conducted uh, in uh, the west coast of the United States and here they looked at over 4,000 children of three different age groups uh, 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 across changes of air pollution levels in California as legislation uh, was enacted. So they recorded a reduction in air pollution levels across about an eight year period. And what you can see here as air pollution started to decrease in California, we got a decrease in incident asthma and asthma severity, establishing causality really between air pollution and this disease in children. Moreover, if we look at when this exposure is occurring, the early life uh, time is particularly important. And this is a, a study from Vancouver showing in over 65,000 children that it is air pollution in the first few weeks and years of life, which seems to be important in setting the lung on a trajectory towards asthma, because they were able to demonstrate very clearly that the, the new asthma that was occurring uh, in Canada at that time uh, was in large part attributed to air pollution exposure during infancy and possibly even during pregnancy. So this is demonstrating really that programming of the lung early in life is probably a key factor in a lot of the new asthma that's being associated with increased air pollution levels. And taking it on a world scale, this is a paper published in Lancet Planet Health last year, showing really the results of 194 countries in relation to oxides of nitrogen exposure in those countries, looking at asthma. And what we can see here is that uh, on a worldwide scale, not just in any single country, that air pollution and one aspect of air pollution, NO2, accounted for 13% of the global incidence of new asthma occurring year on year. And I think if we put all the pollutants into that model, it would be much higher than 13%. So what are we talking about in terms of early life exposure? Well, we're talking about air pollution penetrating to the developing baby in the uterus during fetal gestation. And here we have small air pollution particles shown in the bottom right here that are theoretically impacting in the placenta and possibly changing the behavior of the placenta in terms of modifying the growth characteristics of the baby. But I think what is really very alarming is that not only do these particles get entrapped in the placenta, but they also pass to the fetal side of the placenta. And of course that means that they may even pass to the developing fetus itself. And on the right hand side, you can see the relationship between residential black carbon exposure and the placental black carbon that was detected uh, in this particular study. So this is a concern and it rather suggests that pregnant women who are exposed to high level of pollution um, are taking this into their bodies, passing it into the placenta and possibly across the placenta to the developing child where it's having fetal effects. And we know there are fetal effects because we know that air pollution increases uh, the termination of pregnancy. We know it increases um, miscarriage. We know it increases the development uh, of smaller lungs and smaller hearts in children born in polluted areas. And the mechanisms have been hotly debated as to how this might occur, but certainly what we call epigenetic mechanisms that is the way that pollutants either through the placenta or in the baby itself uh, are able to change the uh, methylation of particular uh, promoter regions of genes involved in morphogenesis of the lung, brain and heart probably are important here. And I've just listed three publications here which illustrate some of the exciting new biology now uh, connecting air pollution to this epigenetic driving of 
uh, organ of, of disordered organ development uh, in the fetus. And of course, it's the small airways at the end of the lung here, which is important. And the development of these small airways and the alveoli, which occur, of course, not only in the uh, in the uterus as the baby develops, but also across the first eight to 10 years and even longer in life as the lung grows. Um, it is these small airways that become truncated. And it has been estimated that children born in areas of high air pollution uh, have about three generations of airways missing from their lung as a direct result of that exposure uh, across uh, the first 10 years of their life. So this is a serious issue that really deserves much more attention. Also, uh, we are realizing now that air pollution affects the brain. It affects the brain in ways that are only just being uncovered. This is an interesting study where in New York where they looked at a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease called the APOE Epsilon 4 mutation and were able to demonstrate that this mutation which is the most prevalent genetic risk factor for uh, um, Alzheimer's dementia uh, if people were born and brought up in an air polluted area then the chances of them developing Alzheimer's disease of a more aggressive nature if they had the homo homo uh, um, homozygous genetic abnormality compared to the heterozygous genetic abnormality was really very profound. In other words, if you were genetically at risk uh, for developing Alzheimer's disease, if you lived in an air polluted environment, the chances of you developing more severe and earlier onset dementia was greater. And this was subsequently modeled in a mouse which overexpressed this particular APOE uh, epsilon 4 mutation here and when they developed a mouse that did that and exposed the mouse to PM 2.5 they could show that amyloid levels in the brain the amyloid beta uh, was increased in these mice again suggesting that this important genetic susceptibility uh, underpinned uh, a risk factor for developing air pollution acceleration of dementia. And of course, that's only one gene involved in dementia. Uh, but it makes the point here that people who are at risk of developing these diseases, if they are exposed to air pollution, their disease is uh, more severe and of earlier <coughs> So let me now uh, look at some of the possible causes behind that. And this is an incredible study that was published a few years ago where they used a new imaging technique in the brain to be able to detect metal particles. And you're able to see here that the metal particles shown in the, the um, middle uh, diagram on the left um, are embedded within the amyloid plaques within the brain. And when they looked at the characteristics of these particles, you can see on the left hand side that they were mostly made up of the ferric salts, the ferric ions, uh, which are characteristic of the metal particles emitted from engines uh, in air pollution. So this is a very important observation because what it's telling us really is that these nanoparticles of iron and other metals are penetrating Again, the brain uh, and forming uh, anidus Again, in really, amyloid Again, Again, really grow really really that period of time. How these particles get into oh, the brain uh, inhalation through the nose, through the cribriform plate, but of course the most likely explanation is that they are absorbed from the lung as you can see in the bottom right hand side here. So that really is dementia but of course there are other chronic diseases over the life course. Another one is cardiovascular disease. This is a recent study from Mexico City which has equivalent air pollution I think to some of your cities in Thailand and here they looked at the hearts of young people who had tragically died in road traffic accidents, who were thought to be normal. And they looked at their hearts to have a look at what they could detect in the cardiac fibers. 
And we're able to demonstrate again, as in the brain, um, billions of these magnetic nanoparticles present in the cardiac fibers in these young people, suggesting that the nanoparticles were of air pollution were penetrating the heart cells and activating the oxidant pathways in those heart cells and obviously increasing their risk of cardiovascular disease. And this just shows you in that study the size of these particles and you can see that most of them are between 10 and 20 nanometers. So these are the ultrafine particles which I referred to earlier, the nanoparticles. And you can see the picture, uh, electron micrograph picture at the top, showing the iron particles uh, present in the cardiac fibers, along with manganese, both of which are present uh, in emissions from uh, petroleum and diesel vehicles. And looking at a more detailed crystalline analysis of the metals in the cardiac myocytes, you can see here these little crystals that are shown uh, on the top left hand side compared to an air pollution particle uh, from Oxford on the bottom left hand side you can see uh, that these are magnetite and maghematite which again are the metals uh, the sort of metals that are emitted from uh, uh, air pollution particles that become oxidized once emitted and obviously are forming these nano materials that are penetrating in this case the heart as was the case in the brain. So I was asked, do we need a new Clean Air Act? Well, here in the United Kingdom, we definitely need one. And there are attempts, as you can see here, uh, to try and get a new Clean Air Act into the United Kingdom. All sorts of different um, attempts by politicians to try and uh, get past government a new Clean Air Act. Well, I'm pleased to say that today, Today, the 18th of November, we have uh, a declaration by our Prime Minister uh, saying that diesel and petrol cars are going to be removed from all of our roads by 2030. So the internal combustion engine is finished. And I think that will have an enormous effect on cleaning up not only the NO2, but also some of the smaller particles I've just been talking about and have an effect on moving us to this next greener uh, existence for our future generation. So I think for your own country, this is becoming an incredibly urgent factor now. I think as countries are beginning to move towards clean energy and clean air, we're going to benefit environmentally and health-wise from this. And I hope that the political uh, agenda in, in your own uh, countries are able uh, to be able to uh, absorb this adequately because it is such an urgent issue now that it does need, I think, political pressure to be able to make the changes necessary. And these changes, of course, will only happen if the public come behind the effort. And the public, of course, are absolutely 100% needed for this because people will only change their behaviour towards moving to different forms of transport or whatever if they feel that it's easy, that it's going to benefit their families in some ways, that they feel empowered in some way to do this and that they consider that doing this is a normal and rewarding activity. So let's hope the next 10 years uh, this happens and I wish you every success in your bid to try and get a new Clean Air Act in Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sir Stephen Hawking. Now we are going to have the Q&A questions. So I'm going to start first. So during nowadays we have COVID-19 pandemic. Do you have any problem relation between air pollution and COVID-19 mortality or morbidity? Well, thank you very much. Uh, we actually don't know much about the mortality and morbidity in relation to air pollution and COVID. Uh, there was a lot of publicity uh, around the world about the decrease in ambient air pollution as a result of the lockdowns that different countries had as a result of COVID-19. 
Uh, and of course, everybody suddenly realized that the air could be cleaned up. Uh, if we removed a lot of the vehicles from the road and that was a wonderful thing to witness um, but in all of the countries of course as we've come out of lockdown uh, the air pollution has returned again now the big question really is whether the link between the uh, air pollution and uh, the COVID-19 incidents and the COVID-19 deaths which have been reported whether they are directly related or indirectly related is hotly debated there is a suggestion you know, from Italian work and from others now that the particles that we've been talking about today can carry virus particles on their cell surface. Now the big question really is whether those uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 viruses can survive on the surface of these toxic pollutant particles. Uh, if they can't, well, it's, it's an irrelevant observation, but if they can, then obviously this is a mechanism for whereby the, the pollutant uh, can carry viruses from one place to another. So I think the court is still out on that whipperat, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful within the next, maybe next six months, we should get some clear answers on that one, because it is clearly hugely important. So what uh, we get from your lecture is that uh, some uh, measure that could be done in our country is to uh, do something that can reward the people first so yeah. that people will follow the suggestion and also we need the political pressure to uh, have the Clean Air Act as in, uh, in Thailand as well as uh, like in, in Britain as well. And yes. the, the first step is to uh, have the clean energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in the, this morning, I just visited uh, the environmental department, uh, de department of the Ministry of, um, uh, what do you say, uh, Ministry of Pollution. Yeah. Yes. And we are uh, thinking about uh, changing the, the petrol. In, yeah. in our country to use uh, Euro 5. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that is a good uh, direction to do so? Yes, indeed. I mean, it's definite progress. I think going forward beyond that, um, you know, using biofuels uh, would be quite a good way forward for Thailand because you have a lot of resources where you could generate biofuels which emission, which are reduced by 90% the emissions uh, from combustion. So they're even better than the Euro 5 and the Euro 6. Um, and I think, you know, trying to think ahead now as to what might start to get the ball moving. I mean, my suggestion as paediatricians, as we've done here in the United Kingdom, is to take individual cases I mean, that little girl, Ella Kissa Deborah, age nine, that has had more effect on politicians than all of the statistics that everybody's been able to throw at them because they can identify with an individual human being much more easily than they can identify with mathematics and statistics. So my suggestion uh, to you again as paediatricians is to ask your colleagues to see if they can identify any children who has a severe disease, in particular severe asthma, but it needn't be asthma, it could be another lung disease, where you feel there is a, a close relationship to air pollution. And if you can arm those people with portable monitors so that they can actually look at the air pollution in their locality in relation to the child that they are talking about, then this becomes a very powerful local uh, argument to get the politicians uh, aligned. And I think the medical profession have a, quite an important role to play here because they are the trusted messengers. People trust doctors uh, and nurses and physiotherapists. So if you can be the messengers and use the exemplars of your patients to help change the argument within government, then I think that would be a very powerful direction to take this. Yes, thank you for your kind suggestion. 
I believe that we can, as a pediatrician, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that this mm -hmm. may be the first step that we can mm -hmm. conduct the study to yeah. show the government. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Well, especially you've got two or three cities that are particularly bad, haven't you? I mean, obviously Bangkok is one, but there are two or three other cities in Thailand. Yeah, the um, one that we mention uh, most is uh, Chiang Mai. Yeah. 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 That is in the north part mm -hmm. of Thailand. Right. And the south of M2.5 mm -hmm. differ from Bangkok. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We also have the, our member mm -hmm. of the PM2.5 committee working yeah. over there. And he uh, believes that the source of PM2.5 coming from burning um, forest. Burning forest. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, you see, the toxicology of particles from forest fires, as the Australians have shown recently, uh, and your colleagues in Malaysia, uh, are equally, if not more toxic than diesel particles. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so all particles aren't the same. Mm -hmm. So, if if you burn your toast, uh, or if you you know breathe in diesel or breathe in um, you know sea salt. Uh, as particles. They have different toxicology, even though they're all particles. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to differentiate the sources of these particles, because obviously forest fires, which you're talking about now, uh, are highly toxic. Um, and if you look at the statistics in Australia, the hospital admissions and death rate during the fires of last year, the terrible fires that they had, um, were very considerable indeed. And I'm sure Again, in Thailand, if you can gather that information uh, where you're tracking the uh, fo forest fire related pollution against hospital emissions for children, for asthma uh, and maybe other uh, conditions, uh, that would be another powerful argument to make with your government. And also what I know is that the, the forest fire that uh, occur in the north part of Thailand uh, that's not caused mm -hmm. by natural, mm -hmm. it's caused by people. Right, well there we are again, you see. Yeah, people. people, and people uh, deforestation and the environment and, uh, you know, the environment always seems to keep coming back, doesn't it? <laughs> that is very, see, uh, sorry. Yes, uh, we, since we are the agricultural country uh, farming for the industrial, like a sugar cane, they need to burn to the have forest. a good price uh, yes, uh, yes. to make the, the sugar cane dry. And uh, industrial encourage them to fire every year. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing, you know, to recall is that the, the technology of composting, um, where even wood can be composted now with new technology, means that one doesn't have to burn um, you know, locally, one can actually put the material back on the land again if you had the technology to do it. And I think advanced composting technology uh, would be another area in Thailand that might actually be of great advantage to your people. Because they could then save money by doing that, because obviously, you know, they'll be preserving you know, the, the nutrients uh, which they can put back on the land. But the, the technology is quite sophisticated now. So within eight months, you can completely compost wood uh, down to uh, material you can put on the, the, on, on the land. So the fact that you can do that so rapidly uh, means that it could be actually quite an advance for your agricultural sector, rather than just burning, uh, you know, dead material. What about the uh, standard value of the PM 2.5 in Thailand? Uh, as you say that the value that's set in Thailand is maybe two times higher than suggested by the WHO. Mm -hmm. Do you think this one is too high for, for uh, human health? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're at about 50, average at about 50 micrograms per meter cubed across the year. I mean, winter's worse than summer, obviously. Uh, but I think you've got to try and get this down to, tw to 25. I mean, that's a tough call. So it has to be done in stages. Um, and I think some of the suggestions that you already came up with to move towards cleaner uh, fuels 
is the first step in all of this. Uh, I think the second, which is often not appreciated, is the, the quite a bit of the particle pollution comes from tires and from brakes, not from the combustion of the fossil fuels. And of course, the tires, uh, the particles emitted from tires are very toxic because they are from rubber and the rubber is heated as it comes off the road and those particles become very reactive. So I think it would be interesting from your uh, research uh, point of view to try and understand more about what makes up the particulate pollution in your cities, uh, how much of its emissions, how much of it comes from the road brakes and tires, and how much of it comes from secondary pollutants. Um, due to chemical reactions, then how much comes from the forest fires uh, surrounding the country. Um, so try to put together an inventory of um, emissions so that you can know where to concentrate your efforts of cleaning up. Because without knowing where the pollutants, which pollutants are causing the issues, one's really just assuming they're all causing the same problem, whereas in fact they probably are not. And from uh, your, some study that you chose to ask in your slides, that uh, you, uh, some research found uh, some metal like uh, iron yeah. or zinc mm -hmm. in the brain of the people. How do they know that it's come from air pollution? Well, it's the nature of the metal that they're finding. So they're finding uh, iron in its ferric state. Well, iron normally exists in its ferrous state. Uh, two valency rather than three valency. So in order to get to its ferric state it has to experience high temperature uh, which of course is what happens in an internal combustion engine um, that the iron gets converted and secondly they're finding the iron along with the transition metals um, manganese and vanadium which are two other metals which are put into the engine block uh, to increase its hardness so I think it's really a bit of detective work here, forensic uh, work, which is leading them to the source, uh, the most likely source of the iron uh, coming from engines um, of one form or another. Um, and I think that the important thing here is that it's, it's the nanoparticles. They're even lower size than PM 2.5, which are the ones uh, penetrating these tissues. Um, and therefore, we're not measuring ultrafine particles, and I'm sure they're not being measured in Thailand either. But if you were to measure them, you might be deeply shocked at the levels of these very, very, very small particles because they're the most toxic. Actually, we have some audience from Indonesia as well. Right. Uh, have any questions? Because I, I heard that Indonesia also has a lot of problem of PM2.5 yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, well the forest fires are a big issue in Indonesia, aren't they, as well. And, uh, you know, we hear about the terrible fires that, uh, you know, those parts of the world experience. And uh, even in Singapore, I think they experience the, uh, the air pollution coming from some parts of Malaysia. Uh, as a direct result. Of Thailand, we also have... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I, I think the politics around transboundary air pollution are quite complicated because obviously, you know, you don't just generate your own pollution and neither does any other country. You know, it's, our, it's the countries we kind of sit adjacent to us that generate pollution that blows over us. Um, and again, that, you know, that is a political issue, um, especially if it's harvesting an increased number of deaths in a country. Um, you know, it becomes politically quite sensitive. Mm -hmm. That is uh, politics between the countries, yeah. not yeah. in the countries. Country, yes. Yeah, exactly. But I think sustainability uh, and the environment is the key to all of this, really, because if we start moving towards sustainable energy and move away from burning uh, fossil fuels, we'll meet the climate change objectives as well as the air pollution objectives. And, and I think, you know, looking at our children into the future 
if they can come into a world free of carbon in the air and, and, a, and a, a, an environment which is so much cleaner than it is now, then I think our generation will be thanked for doing that. So maybe um, is um, because of the COVID-19. So often the people often now wear masks in Thailand. Yes. So at this moment, it would be helpful uh, for uh, PM 2.5 too. Well, that's a good point. And the question is, you know, how effective are they at filtering? Um, I mean, I don't know how, how the argument goes in Thailand, but the argument here uh, in Europe is that the mask prevents you infecting other people as opposed to protecting you against infection. Um, and I would imagine the same is true uh, with particles. It really won't protect you as an individual unless you have these very tight fitting masks, which are very uncomfortable. Um, so I, I think it's more about preventing the cough and the sneeze from spreading the droplets which contain the virus mm -hmm. uh, rather than protecting you <laughs> from other people. But I think that in Thailand we are very good uh, practice on mask, <laughs> yeah. even a small child yes. in a like yeah. a in the garden, mm -hmm. they would like to go to school, not to be locked down in their home. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, of course, yes. I mean, you're, you're right. And, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm really pleased that your schools are still running and things. And, uh, you know, they are here as well in the UK, but we've had a period where the schools weren't. Um, and of course, the children suffered very badly during that period, both from their educational and mental health um, aspects. So, you know, trying to keep children at school is a really important thing, not only for the children's sake, but for the parents' sake as well. Yeah. And do you think that nose uh, irrigation or nose watch mm -hmm. uh, would be helpful to prevent the PM? Well, that's another good question. Thank you. Uh, and somebody else asked me that recently and I wasn't able to answer it. I suspect it might. Um, but I think, you know, the experimental background of all of this is quite uh, small at the moment, but I think it's an interesting idea. Um, and I think especially for things like COVID virus, you know, I mean, they're talking about the, the nasal epithelium, uh, particularly that epithelium overlying the cribriform plate at the back of the nose where the olfactory nerves are that has a very high density of, of the ACE2 receptor. Um, and obviously if one is able to, I'm talking about COVID now, um, one is able to rinse the nose and prevent the virus gaining access to that, that would be great. But if PM2.5 and ultrafines are also penetrating the brain through that crib reform plate, uh, then yes, indeed. I mean, this is an interesting idea you have. And, uh, um, so I, I think, you know, we have to be adventurous here and try new techniques and see whether they help. <laughs> yes, my, my own uh, experience is that I have one patient with chronic sinusitis yeah. and I uh, asked them, ask him to have the nose irrigation. Mm -hmm. The first time in his life mm -hmm. to have nose irrigation and they found like a carbon material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm from his nose mm -hmm. and I asked where the, 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 man, the boy located and uh, she, he located in a bad traffic oh, area. His house, right? Yeah, his house. Mm -hmm. his yes. Yes. Area. Well, that's so, very interesting indeed. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you've got plenty of evidence, I think, to, uh, <laughs> to act upon. <laughs> Okay, I think it's about the time, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah about nine o'clock. Okay, so uh, let me uh, give you my uh, um, thank you talk. <laughs> so on behalf of the Royal College of Pediatricians of Thailand and Pediatric Society of Thailand, I would like to extend my gratitude to our speaker and moderator for this very informative and constructive session. In particular, I would like to thank Sir Stephen Holgate for his superb talk, which has not only raised much awareness 
but also lighten up future efforts to minimize the problem of PM 2.5 in this country and hopefully worldwide. We are proud to inform you that the Royal College of Pediatricians of Thailand foresee the burden of health effect of PM 2.5, especially in children. We therefore set up a committee of PM 2.5 under the umbrella of the Royal College since June 2020. May I show you the picture of our committee? Our team comprises of pediatric allergists and pulmonologists who are interested in this pollution. Our team is working as volunteers, collect necessary and factual knowledge, educate Thai pediatrician, provide PM 2.5 information to the public through our Facebook and website, and collaborate with related authorities, such as Pollution Control Department, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. This special lecture is the latest one of our Zoom lecture series, in which we have set up as regular schedule once a month since June this year. I don't know exactly how to describe how much appreciation we have towards your contribution. So Stephen, your lecture has encouraged us to work and fight against PM 2.5 for the brighter future of our children. We hope that we can keep contact with you and consult with you for any problems that may occur. And also, may I give you a small gift, just only small one, of appreciation. We will send it to you by regular mail later. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Dr. Chirilak, yes, this is. <laughs> you inspire us very, very much, and I will go on our job. Yes, we will go on our job. <laughs> In addition, we should be most grateful if you would accept to be our honorary advisor mm -hmm. for our team. Thank you, Sir Stephen Holgate. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. and. Uh, I feel deeply honoured and privileged to uh, be party, uh, party to this incredibly exciting new initiative you started. So congratulations, you'll be setting an international trend here, I hope. Uh, and if I can help in any way, I'm more than delighted to do so. Uh, Thailand is a wonderful country and I feel I have real friends there. So it'll be a delight interacting with you all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You Bye -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.